Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers, presented by FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education. So, what's new and exciting in your world this weekend? There's an anniversary this week. Fifty years ago this month, President Richard Nixon declared war on drugs. The drug war was largely responsible for a dramatic rise in U.S. incarceration rates. As of today, the United States has, by far, the highest incarceration rate in the world. We're at around 600 inmates per 100,000 adult population. For comparison, European countries' incarceration rates are typically less than one-sixth this level. Japan's incarceration rate is 40 Germany's is 70, the UK's is slightly over 100, even China's is only 120. Ours is around 600. That's 600 incarcerated per 100,000 adults. Prior to the war on drugs, the U.S. incarceration rate was around that found in the rest of the developed world. But there's some good news. The U.S. incarceration rate peaked in 2008 and has been falling ever since. This coincided with a gradual rolling back of the drug war. In 1996, California became the first state to legalize medical cannabis. By 2000, seven states, Oregon, Alaska, Washington, Maine, Hawaii, Nevada, and Colorado followed. By 2008, six more states had legalized medical cannabis, and two, Nevada and Massachusetts, had decriminalized it. In 2012, Colorado and Washington became the first states to legalize recreational cannabis. Since then, recreational cannabis has become legal in 23 states and decriminalized in another nine. And last year, Oregon became the first state to decriminalize all recreational drugs, including heroin and cocaine. There's no question that drugs can destroy lives, but it's taken Americans a half century to figure out that the war on drugs was destroying even more lives than did drugs. Let this be a painful lesson to all the busy bullies out there who would tell people how to live their lives, whether it be by outlawing drugs or restricting marriage or dictating how much workers must be able to earn if they are to be allowed to work. The cure you impose on people can be worse than the disease you seek to cure. And when this happens... It can take a half century or more before we're able to shake off the cure. On the fun side of this, though, Aunt, I did, what was it, maybe four or five days ago, drive not more than six miles away from my house and went to the marijuana store. It was just that easy. I walked in the door. There was a person there, and she said, what good businessmen always say, how can I help you? And I said, oh, give me some of that. And she did. I paid and I left. And it was really quite wonderful. Well, if you remember, before the age of COVID, you and I went into a marijuana store in California. I was blown away by how reasonable everything was. You see on the television, it's a seedy back alley deal or something. This might as well have been an upscale mall store. So, and for my part this week, I want to think about imprisoning some of our number. And here I'm thinking about those QAnon people who are so evidence resistant, I think that they cannot even be reached. The FBI has warned lawmakers, congressmen, that QAnon's digital soldiers may become more violent. What is a QAnon digital soldier? That's a really good question. I don't really know. Near as I can tell, it appears to be kind of fat, bloated people who (laughs) sit in their mother's basements ready for the next big thing to come along as predicted by Q. Unfortunately, Q has been very wrong about almost everything. And I got to tell you, it's really not worth the wait. This guy, he is having such a laugh at everybody's expense that I don't even know what to say to them anymore. The latest nonsense out of this camp is that somehow in August, Donald Trump will be brought back to Washington, sworn in, and Joe Biden will just have to go. They seem to believe this. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Right. But this is just ridiculous. I don't know how we get here. And believe it or not, Ant, that was not the foolishness of the week. This is yet another week where we had a whole lot of competition between just news ideas and just stupid things. I want to talk about our vice president, Vice President Harris. When asked pointedly by Lester Holt, and look, By any estimation, Lester Holt's a decent human being, right? You don't look at him and think, wow, there's a partisan hack that we could all live without. He asked Harris why she hasn't visited the border. 
Remember, the border was all the rage when Donald Trump was president and we had kids in cages and we had to hear about that every night. Well, as it turns out, there are still kids in cages. It's operating roughly the same as it ever has. And Vice President Harris, when asked pointedly about this, she said, we've been to the border about three or four times. We've been to the border. We've been to the border. We've been to the border. And God bless Lester Holt because he looked up and said, you haven't been to the border, which is the truth. She has not. And she said, I haven't been to Europe, as if that somehow was a smart thing to say. It's baffling. I thought that was the case back when she was just running for the office. And now that she's vice president, I think it's still the case. Anybody out there who thinks that this is the brilliant counterpunch to the Trump administration is an idiot. This is more of the same nonsense. To get more Ant and James, buy a copy of our excellent book, Cooperation and Coercion. You can find the paper and electronic versions on Amazon and the audio version on Audible. Bob Luddy is an entrepreneur and president and founder of Captive Air Systems, the nation's leading manufacturer of commercial kitchen ventilation systems. Captive Air employs over 1,100 people across 90 sales offices and six manufacturing plants in North Carolina, Iowa, Oklahoma, California, Pennsylvania, and Florida. Inc. Magazine has repeatedly named Captive Air one of the top 500 fastest-growing companies in the U.S. While we're always interested in good entrepreneur stories here on Words and Numbers, the reason we've asked Bob to come talk to us has nothing to do with Captive Air. Rather, we've asked him on to talk about another entrepreneurial venture he started, Thales College. In 2007, Bob founded Thales Academy, a private kindergarten through 12th grade school that emphasizes classical education. Thales Academy currently has 3,600 students and 11 locations in three states. Following his success with Thales Academy, Bob has applied his ideas to his latest project, Thales College. Thales College will offer undergraduate degrees in entrepreneurial business and mechanical engineering, based on the same classical model that made Thales Academy so popular. Much of our discussion deals with accreditation. Most colleges and universities in the United States are accredited. Higher education accrediting bodies are a self-policing mechanism. Participation is voluntary, and the accrediting bodies are nonprofit, non-governmental, and supported by member institutions. There are several accrediting bodies throughout the country, each of which is responsible for accrediting colleges and universities within its geographic area. While U.S. colleges and universities are not required to be accredited, only students at accredited institutions are eligible for federal financial aid, and those institutions must be accredited by an accrediting body that is recognized by the Department of Education. All of this creates a government-backed guild system. While anyone is free to start a college or university, existing institutions can restrict competition by withholding accreditation. And while anyone is free to start a competing accreditation body, government funding is only available to institutions accredited by accrediting bodies that are recognized by the Department of Education. In short, accrediting bodies largely control competition in higher education, and the Department of Education largely controls competition among accrediting bodies. Meanwhile, accreditation isn't granted on the basis of the quality of education. Accreditation rules focus on things like the number of faculty and their degrees, technology and financial resources, and the clarity with which the institution communicates what it is students can expect to learn. The closest accreditation comes to verifying educational quality is that it requires that institutions have in place some means of testing that students learn what their professors say they should learn. And this often takes the form of institutions altering the descriptions of what students should learn to match what the students are actually learning. In short, the largest effective accreditation is to protect colleges by making it difficult to found more of them. Welcome to Words and Numbers. Pleasure to be here. 
We were fascinated when we ran across a description of Thales, and you have Thales Academy, which is K through 12, and what caught our attention was Thales University, which is in the works. And the interesting thing about it is that James and I have talked for many years about problems in higher education. In our estimation, one of the largest problems is that it's a guild system. You can't get in without being accredited, and the accreditation requires all sorts of nonsense. Basically, it's designed to keep out competitors. And here you have come along, and you've said you're not going to be pursuing accreditation, which on the one hand, we think is exactly the right model. On the other, we can't imagine how that would work. I'll give you an interesting comment. I went to LaSalle University, received a BS in finance. And 50 years later, the accreditation board for college B schools decided to give out, it was a hundred year anniversary, so they gave a hundred leadership awards and I received one of them. So that was the first time I ever knew I went to an accredited B school. Nobody ever asked. I was not aware of it. I just wasn't tuned into it. As an entrepreneur, I don't believe in bureaucracy. Most entrepreneurs want to destroy bureaucracy, which is how they succeed. And accreditation is nothing but bureaucracy. That's all it is. It's very arcane. Our focus at Thales College is to develop critically thinking, morally formed minds. And my view of education, particularly under accreditation, is everything's a checkoff. So if you get the checkoff, you get the BS or the BA, you graduate. That's not what we want to do. So our focus is on developing that student. It's not on checkoffs. And if you submit to accreditation, by the very nature, you submit to the checkoff process. When I went to LaSalle, I took business law. It was taught by a real lawyer in practice, and it was a tremendous course. I guess he had a PhD in jurisprudence, as the case would be. To me, accreditation is outmoded. It's a tool of the government. And we're not going to accept any government funds because one of our principles is to be isolated from the government to the extent possible. So in the entrepreneurial world, we don't want to rely on government for anything. We do have to comply with government regulations and laws. That's some of the thinking. We're going to form a new type of student that's moral, that doesn't follow the crowd. We're going to teach the truth and we're going to teach what we think are the best outcomes which is how I run my company. The way you're approaching this is very, very familiar to me. I'm a political philosopher by training. And what you're describing is a Greek education in no uncertain terms. And then it's fascinating because we all see that you've named it Thales. So if you could give us some indication of what elements of that sort of thinking, ancient thought, do you find operational in your own endeavors? For example, we challenge each other. And one of the things I said early on, if someone comes into this company and they've worked here for 30 or 90 days and they can perform at the same level that somebody's been here for 30 years, we're going to pay them the same amount of money. We're going to treat them the same and we're going to use their ideas. Whereas in most companies, you need a lot of tenure for your ideas to have any standing. So we continuously challenge each other at any level. And I even ask young individuals, technicians, engineers, when they come into the company, if you have a good idea and nobody will pay attention, if you email directly to me, I will pay attention and I will make sure it gets a fair hearing. So our whole focus is on the truth, the best possible outcome, and continuously retesting everything we think we know. Because sometimes we may have been right in a particular time frame, but five years later, it's not the right answer. I want to go back to accreditation for a moment, because amongst the various constituencies, you've got government, which you've already gotten around that problem by saying you're not going to take government money, so accreditation isn't an issue there. The other's employers, and we're finding as time goes on and college tuition gets higher and higher, that everybody's rethinking, including employers, whether it means anything to have a degree from an accredited institution, as opposed to being able to demonstrate that you know various things. I think you've got those two under control. The one that bothers me is a third constituency, and that's graduate schools. Right. Because again, you bump up against the guild system. A graduate from Thales, if I'm understanding it correctly, won't be able to get into a graduate school because of the lack of accreditation. Is that the case? 
That's probably true of certain graduate schools, but it's also true you may not get into that graduate school even if you have a BA from an accredited college. I certainly believe that worthy students are going to be accepted into graduate school. But one of the points I wanted to make is our chief engineer who came with me in 99, a couple of years later said, should I get a master's degree in engineering? And I said, no, because you're going to get a master's degree every two years here. And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to find the best engineering and scientific professors around the country. And we're going to meet them if we can. And we're going to learn from them. So here we are, fast forward 20 years later, that engineering team is vastly superior to the industry because they learn from the masters. So we're kind of back to Greek education. As opposed to you could go to a very good university and receive a master's degree, but not know about many very important theories, whether it's philosophy, economics, engineering. So our focus is to learn from the masters and not rely on a degree. I might make this comment somewhere around 1993, Jim Cook, who founded the Boston Beer Company, Samuel Adams, said there's two worlds. There's a credentialed world and there is the non-credentialed world. And he said, we live in the non-credentialed world. So the entrepreneurial world for a long time and maybe always has been primarily non-credential. The man who did most of our electronic boards never went to college. He's retired now. Set up the whole entire platform for us. Do you think for one minute any entrepreneur would turn this man away because he didn't have a degree? Absolutely not. And Jim Cook made a really important point. What you've actually seen in recent years is a migration of that philosophy into major companies where they realize they need talent and they can be very snooty that you have a master's degree. But if they can't hire the right people, you've seen many, many corporations now relax that whole idea. It's interesting you bring up Jim Cook. I think he's a great example. When Samuel Adams first hit the market, it was widely seen to be a boutique beer. It wasn't for everybody. It was a special thing that beer lovers might like a little more than they like their Budweiser. And slowly but surely, it picked up market share. I don't know that we could call it a boutique beer exactly anymore. But Cook, he knew whose market was. He absolutely knew who the market was. And it wasn't everybody. And it seems that with Thales College, you're approaching it exactly the same way. You're not appealing to everybody here. You're appealing to people who are risk takers. They're not risk averse and who care a lot more about excellence than they care about safety. And it's the exact opposite of what colleges and universities are currently trying to do, which is to appeal to everybody. And that just never works. How do you attract the right people, both on the employment side and on the student side? I know you've got a number of schools, K through five, and then some K6, some K8, and then a junior and senior high school. So obviously, your system becomes at least a potential feeder for students. Where else do you look and how do you prevail upon, well, guys like us who you might want to come and work there? What do you tell people when you say you want them to come around? This summer, Thales Academy will have 5,000 students. So obviously, we're appealing to a wide range of people. Now, one thing I learned about teachers, they want the satisfaction that they were a successful teacher in developing young people. And when they receive that satisfaction, they tend to stay with you. What they really don't like is a teacher in the next room over not doing their job, not doing the same thing. When you don't have tenure, you don't have that tenured teacher next door that retired on the job. So there's a large subset of teachers, and it's the preferred teachers, the ones that we want, that don't want tenure, don't care about it, because they know they're good enough to get a job anywhere, anytime. They want to work in an environment where people really care about the outcomes. You can bring the same thing about to college. Professors, and I meet a lot of them, they become very, very frustrated for many, many reasons. Some of those reasons are you have difficult professors, they have tenure, they're gonna be there for a lifetime. So I know any number of professors that are very happy to work in a non-tenured environment, provided that it's the right environment to utilize their skills. By not having tenure, we're attracting the right people. We're getting a double bonus here. <laughs> we're not getting the marginal people, we're getting the very best people. This goes back to your comments earlier on management. In my experience, both personally and in dealing with other faculty, 
One of the largest complaints is the management from the associate deans to the deans to the vice provost to the provost. There's this <laughs> tremendous bureaucracy. I describe it this way. We exist to serve the bureaucracy. And people will say, you have to do things this way. Why? Well, because the system demands it. Not because it's good education, not because it's good pedagogy, but because the bureaucracy demands it. At Captivere, I set up a system where we're very flatly managed. The principle is a subsidiary. And as a result, ideas can flow freely. And if you're a senior engineer, you want to hear those ideas because you know that makes the company more successful. And those ideas are adjudicated very rapidly. And we prioritize the list of development of new products or a nuance of a product, and it works enormously well. The way we set up a K-5 school is we have a leader, she has an assistant, and there's 500 kids in that school. So every teacher is managing their room under a subset of an agreements and teaching. There's no bureaucracy. Decisions are made right on the scene. Then we work on continuous improvement, which we call Kaizen. There's a tendency today to talk about innovation and thinking outside the box, and most of it's a lot of nonsense. We primarily use Kaizen. So every day we're getting a little better, we're reviewing processes, et cetera. Even at Captivere, and maybe we had 10 innovations in 45 years, but we probably had 10,000 or 50,000 Kaizen steps of improvement. So that's how I view the college, very flat, a team of people that's dedicated to educating these students so that they have happy, productive lives and a sound philosophy and a deep understanding of human nature along with their technical, vocational skills, EQ, virtuous leadership. We want to do all these concurrently because if there's five critical parts of your life, you could have four, and the fifth one you're missing is going to cause you to be less successful, sometimes profoundly less successful. Our focus is going to be to develop students who are willing to put a lot of effort, knowing that that effort is going to pay dividends for the next 60 years of their lives. You put this together in such a way that it's really interesting how you're able to market this to students. And one of the very first things that you see on your website is that cost is addressed. Did you decide this early on that this had to be an affordable thing for the group of people you were looking to bring in? Absolutely, yes. And I'll tell you where that came from. So I went to LaSalle University in the mid-60s, and for four years, I spent $4,000. So I said, what would that be inflated? And it's about $8,000 a year. So that's where the $32,000 came from. And that's worth underlining because you said that you're not accepting federal money. But on the other hand, the tuition for all four years is $32,000. Correct. It's about average for one year, I think, across U.S. colleges and universities. Colleges are tremendously overpriced and they're underperforming. And the only reason they get away with it is that this loan program, which has really undermined the quality of most colleges. Coming back on tenure, a professor could have tenure today, but if they're politically incorrect, they might run them off the campus. Right. So they've undermined their whole tenure program. I'm a firm believer that the only way you change things is you have to have an example on the ground, and the example has to be large over time because it'll gain attention. So Thales Academy in K-12 is in three states. It's gained an enormous amount of attention. We've had something like six charter schools follow us in because we've developed a market of people that realize there's a better way to do things. One of the ideas is over time, we want copycats and we'll help them. Mm -hmm. We'll assist them in any way possible because we don't view it as a competitive business. It's kind of the business of changing the country through a better educational system. Do you have a target student body in mind? By that, I mean numbers. Is there some number you're aiming for, or are you just looking to take as many as you can? Well, we want to start off with 30 students and then grow. We don't have an absolute target, but maybe a college of 500 students would be really nice. And if it was going to be larger than that, maybe you would have another location. I went to a relatively small college, about 1,500 students commuting at that time, and you feel pretty comfortable in that environment. It was a really nice place to be. Some of these universities of 20, 30,000, it's pretty hard to fit in and feel that anybody even knows you on the campus. So I think this idea of personalism, of understanding the student, being engaged with them, helping in every way possible, but also demanding that they work really hard during that time frame. 
with the promise that we're developing you to a much higher level than you would have achieved otherwise. It's interesting because you have diagnosed, I think, every problem that Ant and I have seen over the last 20 years. We got together about 10, 11 years ago, and one of the things that we really wanted to do was go found a college because we knew where the problems were and we figured, well, we can do something that doesn't hit those potholes. And yet it's prohibitive. It's so prohibitive that it's almost impossible to imagine doing it. That you have done it with primary schooling and now moving into the college space is something else. And I wonder if you sense that your background is exactly right, that you needed to be somebody outside the system to diagnose it correctly and come up with an alternative. Oh, absolutely. Matter of fact, we had these philosophy discussions at LaSalle when I was there. Should you try to change the institution or is it so far gone that you need to create a new institution? That stuck with me over the years. If you look at everything that Captive Air, my company, has done, it's all greenfield. We start from scratch. We build new products. We build new factories. We find new ways of distribution and sales. And I love the process. And it's the only way you can succeed because within these large corporations today, they're very static. Colleges are not only static, they're moving backwards. They're not as good as they were 20, 30 years ago. I think very often students are confused. Because if you could say you could do Keynesian economics or you could do Austrian economics, you'll have to decide. And you're really not teaching them anything. From my point of view, it said, we're going to teach Austrian economics because we think that's the right way. It's based on human action. I'll give you a very specific example. We had to take accounting and finance. My accounting teacher was a Christian brother. And the first thing he said was, if you're going to graduate from my accounting and finance, you're going to have a fiduciary duty you're going to follow the generally accepted accounting principles, and you're going to know how to construct a balance sheet, a P&L, and it's going to be done correctly. He gave us very clear instructions. Now, some people maybe didn't follow those instructions, all the gamers on Wall Street today, but because he instructed me the right way to do it, Captivir is probably one of the soundest privately held companies in the U.S. today. And it's based on that instruction. It's very clear and non-negotiable. That's the approach I want to take with Thales College and Academy. I think that's exactly right. The counter argument is that you don't want to indoctrinate the students, to which I reply, look, I'm going to teach the truth as I understand it, and I'm open to students arguing, and from time to time, they do change my mind on certain points. But if, as I've seen in many departments, they just present a bunch of stuff and they say, well, you choose what the truth is. What the students end up doing is asking the professor, what do you want me to write on the paper? That's right. What an absurdity. I'll go one step further. It used to be the case that students couldn't really find out anything about your politics. But now with Google, they just type our names in and they get a dossier on us that's multiple pages long. So generally, I walk in on the first day and I write professor on the board. And I say, I am a professor. And I want you to think about what that means. It means I'm here to offer you my profession. And that's not saying, well, there's this and there's that. And hey, who could ever know anyway? That is not a profession of any kind. I'm here to offer you an understanding of the truth. You may reject it, but I'm going to offer it. And Bob, it sounds like you make guys like me kind of comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> One of my mentors was Dr. William Peterson who was both a student and colleague of Ludwig von Mises at NYU. I didn't have him in college, but I met him 20 years after college. But he literally mentored me for 20 years. He provided such tremendous clarity that it helped me think better. And that's one of the goals of Thales College. I'll give you an example. When Ben Bernanke was appointed Federal Reserve Chairman, I called him up and I said, Bill, do you have any optimism? We have a new Federal Reserve Chair. And all he said was, more of the same. And I said, is there anything else? And he said, as I stated, more of the same. And I learned a profound lesson from that. Don't be a foolish optimist. It's good to be optimistic, and I am optimistic. But he was very clear. Anything he taught me was in that same vein. And if I'm going to learn from a professor, that's exactly what I want. And that's all I want. It would be interesting if we could find you in a couple of years and ask how things have gone. But something tells me Ant and I are going to find you every month or two and figure out how things are moving along for you. What would you consider to be a success here? There's a lot of ways you could define success, but how would you do it? And how will you know when you've achieved it? 
even if we had 30 students and those students went through this program and they had really good lives, that's a level of success. Now, beyond that, I'd like to have 5,000 students in multiple colleges over a period of time. One of the goals that I had for Thales Academy was in order to change people's minds about K-12, I thought it would take a minimum of 25,000 students in multiple states. So we're working toward that goal. And we think in two or three years from now, we'll be at 10,000. So eventually we'll reach that goal, but we've already seen a profound impact. So any really good quality model has the potential to create major change. So I'm more concerned about a really high quality model than I am about quantity because the quantity will come if the model is good. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. This has been great. Hey, I enjoyed it. Thank you. That's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Be sure to join us next week when we have even more fascinating things. Until then, follow us on Twitter. The handles are in the show notes. Send us email. No. Words and Numbers nope. podcast nope. at gmail.com. Don't send email. Join the Words and Numbers backstage Facebook group. You should all join if you haven't. It's actually fun. Find us on Patreon where you can donate to our habit of our, making podcasts. Our habit of making podcasts. And for crying out loud, just be nice to each other. It doesn't take much please just try it for a week. Get back to us. Have a great week. See you next week, James.